Hi everybody, welcome, welcome to Death Con 864. I was going to be like, let's do it. We're going to jump right, right, right in tonight. Uh, my my name's Overcast. Overcast. This, this is, is now month two, actually, actually in the anon uh, anonymity, anonymity series, series that we're going to be doing. doing. Uh, the first uh, month, last, last month in February, we talked about the Tor browser. browser. We walked through the general basics of the Tor, the Tor browser. browser. This, this month, month we're going to dive deep into how, how that plays, plays out as we move into the operating, operating system, system, and then and some good opsec or operational security that we can employ with ourselves if we want to remove ourselves even further out of that. Um, identification, identification pool set. set. And then, and then next, next month, month in April, April. do you want to give a quick overview about, about what you're planning, planning for, for April? April? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, the hook. Yeah, so I'll be, I'll be doing a bit of a um, from, from a personal standpoint and uh, like not, not just looking at tools as a model, 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 but actually answering the questions of who is targeting me, how do I protect myself, um, how do I uh, build in security into my personal daily life without uh, going overboard based off of the threats against me. Um, and that's just kind of an overview. So anyway, so tonight we're going to focus on three operating systems that help abstract our identity from our web usage. And that includes everything from like email, browsing, obviously, but just that general computing experience. We want to take a further step away from being a fixed point location that can be easily tracked by advertisers, um, agencies that go by three or multiple other letters. Um, you know, that kind of aspect of op um, operational security. So there's three main operating systems that I've selected for us to look over tonight. The first one we're going to look at is actually a, a, is a two-part deal, so you, two for one with this option. It's called Hoonix. And what we're looking at right now is the Hoonix gateway. And this is a VM that I'm running right now. And if you were run, going to run Hoonix on your own, that's how you would run it. You wouldn't be running Hoonix on a bare metal install uh, or off of a thumb drive. So Hoonix, if you download it from their website, comes as an OVA. And when you double click on that OVA to load it, it will create the two VMs for you automatically with the network configurations that you need in order for it to function correctly. Because what happens is this gateway that we're looking at right now, and I'm going to leave it on the screen while I talk, and then we'll look at the actual workstation that goes with it. The gateway acts as the proxy for all traffic from the workstation. So it, it abstracts you one layer behind a point that's connected to the Tor network. Okay? And you can, it has decent controls out of the gate. You can see that when you open a terminal, there's already a username and password information disclosure right there on the screen. The default username is user and the password is change me. That is the same for everybody using the OVA. You can modify it if you want to. You know, no. <laughs> we all know in this room that we can change that password, right? Uh, but the, the workstation has the exact same credentials, but it's you know, obviously isolated to that machine. What the workstation does is it only has a host-only network adapter. So I'm running this in uh, VirtualBox, no dissing on the virtualization technology that's been selected for tonight's demo. But it has a host-only network adapter, and the only network that it can connect to is that dedicated Hunix host-only network. Everything goes through the gateway here. So if we were to look at some of the options that exist within the gateway, what you're looking at right now, it's just a typical desktop. You can run the gateway as a standalone you know, head, what we call headless server. No GUI, no graphical environment, and you'll be totally fine. That would require you to download two parts. You'll download the CLI version of Hunix Gateway, and then the, the GUI version of the, the workstation. And they work seamlessly. Um, and that's typically how I usually run it at home. I have the headless version of the, the server, the gateway running. And then and I, use I use the workstation just to do the normal browsing or any other activity that I want to do through Hunix. What, what I want to show you here, though, is there's a, a command called Nix, N-Y-X, that you can run. And it's a, you know, as far as tools on the command line go, it's actually pretty nice. Because it's got this great color coding that shows you the traffic moving through your tunnel connection into the Tor network. So as we, I'm going to minimize this a little bit and leave it off in the background. And while we use the Hunix workstation to actually just browse the internet and use Tor the way we saw last month, you'll see that these spikes occur throughout. Now, if I were to go over to the Hunix workstation, so we're going to leave that running over there. 
So this looks like a standard desktop, Linux desktop that we might install on any old VM that we might want to use. The difference is the tools that come with this, the browser by default is the Tor browser. So if I click on, sorry, I can't make those icons bigger right now. Everything else resizes as well, but so while the Tor browser is loading up, you'll notice that it does the same thing we saw last month when you install Tor browser on your Windows machine. A fixed rate, you know, dimensions on the screen. You can resize those if you want, but by doing that, you're giving away some geometry telltale fingerprint about your identity. So if it's one way that they can track you. So, I mean, if you do modify it, what you're gonna be doing is, you'll be changing, you know, if you go full screen all the time, then it will give away the resolution of your unique fingerprint for that, for that system. I'm gonna leave that the way it is right now, but a couple of the extra tools that they install for you under the applications. You get, and I hope you all can see this, you get key pass, there's a Bitcoin wallet, Tor, the browser, a hex chat, which is a Tor-based chat utility, and then there's another, it's under other, you have a Monero wallet. So out of the box, that's what Hunix comes with from a desktop experience. It's, usually, it's pretty bare bones, all things considered. But you'll notice that Hunix has its own start page when you launch the Tor browser on the workstation. And remember, all this traffic is going through our gateway in the background there. The first thing I want to point out is notice it has a link here called IP check. And this takes advantage of a feature from the Tor project. You'll notice that the website that it's going to is check.torproject.org. And Tor comes back and says, congratulations. Your browser is configured to use Tor. And it says, it your exit node appears to be coming from this IP address. So right there, we've got good confirmation that it's not our local network. It's not the network that I'm hosting here, running this machine on. Uh, and then further down here at the bottom of this sentence, you have relay search. If I right click on that and say open link a new tab, because that exit node rotates occasionally, you're gonna get different relay nodes every time you create a new circuit, every time you create a new identity. But Tor will actually give you information about the exit relay you're, you're leaving. So you can see right now that we're leaving a country in Romania. So that's our exit node. So for the most part, when we visit a website, it appears we're, we're coming from Romania, like just another node on the Romanian network. Okay, so it's showing, you got Netherlands here. I'm gonna just grab the first Bass Pro item that comes up. And we're still on the clear web. That went through Tor, not the... Hunix does, but yeah, you're right. So once that's being done, it's not double encrypting what you're doing. So the gateway is doing the encrypted for us. That's a great point. Thank you. Now, we will see that when we get back over to... Um, yeah, I wasn't trying to modify the website. Oops, yeah, my bad. All right, but we can see some details about the server just by going in and checking out the relay search. So if you're wanting to know, hey, I'd like to do maybe like email or DNS through this or some other service that you'd like to pass through and see if it's going to be blocked or exit this relay, each relay exit node uh, hosting operator gets to choose what services and ports they support leaving. So you can see we do have some traffic going back through here over my very, very slow connection. One, One thing, thing to expect, expect if you use this for, you know, just part, part of your anonymity of accessing stats, like any type of web application platform, it is a lot more testing your, you know, identity, like grab all of the traffic lights, you know, those types of CAPTCHA tests, because a lot of services now can recognize that you're coming out of a Tor exit node. So there's really services that you're hitting that are on the clear web. But they're, they're going to start, start wanting to you to validate your identity because there's a whole lot of bots that traffic can funnel through Tor for anonymity, and so that's kind of the defense mechanism for those services where they're like, well, we want to make sure you're yeah. keep solving all of these problems. But a lot of times with your personal PC, if you're not using Tor, you might get checked once, and then your cookies and everything persists. Tor, you're pretty much getting flagged. And you are coming from a Torx node. So we're going to run some other checks and other areas that could potentially block you. You might see some services that could get disrupted. Pretty rare. 
Like like spec spec captures. Captures. So, that's so that's where I'm going to leave Hoonix. So, so by and large, the benefit of using Hoonix is, is if you want to have it on your physical machine of some kind, right? You just want to run it as a VM, do some general browsing that's kind of contained into that VM. The next series when we talk about Tails is a, my, my personal choice if you're going to use your work laptop and go on a trip and you want to have some kind of a personal experience that doesn't require you to spill your credentials for all your different other sites into your work asset that's being monitored by your company and every other provider that they've, they've subscribed with, right? And that is Tails. So you boot from USB, like thumb drive, and Tails loads up. I'm loading it as a VM right now and fingers crossed this is going to open up just well, just fine. I might need to. It's a good point. Well, it saturates the network. Now, now anything you saved in that desktop, desktop version is not, not going to persist? persist? Is that correct? If you were to load it back up, or is it going to retain anything with like customization? It's a great point. point. So, so when you boot Hoonix, you have two options. The default option in the grub menu is maintains a persistent state of whatever you change. So if you change stuff, it's going to be stored and kept and preserved. So a good offset would be when you boot it up, there's a menu option that displays pick a live OS, and that runs it basically in memory, and it doesn't store as much stuff on disk. I think Hunix in general leaves a little bit more residue. I would love to turn some of our like, like an image, image of that, that over to like others who are more in that forensic, forensic space and just see what can you find. Like maybe put a category of here's some, like five things that I know are on here, see if you can locate those, right? I think that'd be really fascinating to do from an IR perspective. Yeah, as far as like the storage in the device itself, I don't know offhand. I can, well, yeah. But if, but if you're booting on an ISO image, image or an OVA that boots on, on an ISO, ISO, I know that's, that's how Tails works. Tails works. There, there is no storage. storage. It all loads in RAM. RAM. And, and RAM, RAM is your disk. disk. So all of the about the Linux is not encrypted by default because Thank if you, you save the state suspend it, pause it, um, then you can get, get the RAM dump of the, the encryption keys. So you, you can oh, get an encrypted image, you just have to be really careful and make sure you do shut down instead of uh, suspend. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to walk through some of the tools. So there's basically it's the same thing that we've seen every other place, right? There are applications that are installed here by default that, uh, that you can use. Pigeon is here, um, Firebird is here for email. So all of the standard Linux tools that you would have for just a typical Linux desktop experience. Um, Tor is going to be the go-to browser in this scenario, but one of the things that we want to notice here is it's still even if it even if it's <clears throat> protecting what gets stored on the asset that you're using, right? I mean, if you borrow a laptop from somebody and you you, you boot off of Tails, yes, your stuff is remaining in this memory and then vaporized on restart, but it's still not as fully isolated and segmented as we could be. I'm waving my hands around, kind of like a madman. But the next step comes by creating an operating system with security principles first in mind. And that's where you start to think about what is it, the activity that I'm performing and what trust level would I encase that in? Would I call that a trusted zone or would I call it an untrusted zone, right? Just generally surfing the internet, downloading recipes from random WordPress blogs or you know, reading WordPress blogs in general and Medium and stuff. I mean, I mean, and honestly, honestly half, half the time, time, I don't know if you guys have run into this, but, you know, pulling, pulling down shell code, code and stuff like that, that. Um, web, web shells, shells you know, you, half, half the time, time defender flags, flags most of that stuff is being malicious. malicious. I can't I tell you the number of times it's asked if it wants me to submit those to Microsoft for review. I know what they are. I know what's in there, so no thank you. 
but at the same time, if you think about that from a perspective of if I'm, I'm just navigating the internet in an untrusted way, I, I don't necessarily want to risk everything else that's involved in my life. So if I could segment off that untrusted aspects and keep it in its own zone where if it does get popped, maybe there is something on there that's trying to download or run malware, if anything in that area gets compromised, I want it to only be contained to that trust level zone. And that brings in the concept that um, Cubes OS introduced. And so you can create what are called cubes, which are really just virtualized containers. You can think of them as like virtual apps or, you know, even like little virtual operating systems, but they're really a pair of virtualized operating systems. They don't have a root file system. They share a root file system with a template. Cubes looks very similar to everything else. There, there is key differences. Cubes virtualizes everything and it segments off in like three core main areas. You have a DOM zero, which is the main administrative functions for everything that is cubes. You really don't do anything in admin or DOM zero. There's what's called service cubes and they handle any type of communication or traffic between other cubes or app cubes. So you have your network is in its own cube that handles things going back and forth. There's a, a copy paste cube or a a paste, paste buffer, buffer bin, bin and, and it, it isolates, isolates and protects um, if, if the paste or the copy or the, copy, the clipboard, clipboard buffer was available to every VM, VM if you, you copied a password out of your password, password vault then, then every, every other, other virtualized, virtualized container that you have would immediately have access to that same area right or that same password so in this case what happens is you actually have to go through multiple layers in order to do a copy paste function between app layers so if I have my key pass in, in one, one container. container. I do a control C to get the password and a control shift C to get it into the intermediary bucket between all app containers, that service clipboard. And then once you select the app container you want to paste into, it's a control shift V and then a control V to get into the app. Seems crazy and complicated, but the moment you do the control shift V, the clipboard in between that service uh, cube wipes its buffer. So, so, so even, even if something, something compromises the service layer, it, it's, it's refreshed as often and frequently as you're putting something into it because the use, it, use case is gone. So one, one of the, the use cases that I would love to see businesses use Cubes OS for would be stuff like HR, when you're looking at massive amounts of untrusted resumes, PDFs, um, even like healthcare, where you're, you're vetting and screening people to submit back in the PDF for filling out their form for their scheduled appointment that's coming in. Um, and, and even, even law, law departments, departments, legal companies uh, that, are, that are vetting and constantly churning through a massive amount of everything from spreadsheets that may or may not have macros. You know, you can't see, um, or, or even like financial institutions. This is gonna be very limited because in order for Cubes to handle this and do this well, that third layer of app Cubes uh, relies on Zen virtualization framework under the covers. That's actually what's really running in DOM zero. So you'll notice the color coding down the sides. There's red, there's yellow, there's green, there's blue, there's black. And on the surface, that just seems very friendly and nice, right? It's just a color decision. But the reality is we tend to think of red as being dangerous or caution, don't go near there. And that's what Cubes is built into the layer. It's one of the, it's kind of like a psychological reinforcement of good behavior. If you're in a red zone, you want to be more cautious and careful. This isn't where you log into your bank. It's not where you share your deep innermost secrets. It's, it's, it's for the general, what we've been talking about so far, right? It's you just checking things out online, using the Tor browser, and it's all hinged on these templates down here. And you'll notice that, we, that we've got two that are, or actually three that are created, right? We've got a Debian 11, Fedora, and then a Hunix. So Hunix is built into this as well. So you can be running Hunix within Cubes to get the benefits of Hunix, as well as the benefits of Cubes all wrapped into one. Hunix. Cubes does have very strict system requirements, which is why this is actually broken. So I got it to work enough to show somewhat on the screen, but the actual functionality of booting up and going into one of these VMs within a VM on this architecture just isn't gonna happen. So that's what's actually happening under the covers. If we were to go up to this untrusted vault up here for anonymous Hunix and start up the, its, its you know, operating system and then run Tor browser, it would be running in a self-contained area. Let's say we love inspecting malware, and we're playing around with it. We accidentally activate the malware, or we trigger it. 
the only, only thing, thing that can be compromised is what's in that trust zone, zone. is what's, what's in that, that, that virtualized container. container. So, so you, you just, just shut, shut it down, down and it's gone. gone. It was it's just running in memory. memory. It's, it's not, not running, running off of disk or there's, there's nothing stored, stored there. there. And, and worst case scenario, scenario you're, you're blowing, blowing away, away just that template and starting over again from scratch. But the beauty of it is because your virtualized cubes are based on a template, a cube can't spill over and write to its template. Templates only write into the cubes themselves. So the, the full containment of that event that it occurred is just within the cube you were using. Template's fine. You just click play again, you're back up and running, everything's fine. So you could be opening up PDFs all day long, and some of them are trying to run macros, and you'll see some stuff maybe going crazy, maybe tripping on the wire. You just shut it down, you're done. All that's gone and wiped away. There's nothing resident. There's nothing that's able to hook into DOM zero because it can't jump from your cube through your template into the other trust zones. The gold color and the green color and the blue color move closer to something that you would consider more of a personal aspect of your life. Gold is flagged as personal. And that's just if you want to do like any type of documentation, you can create persistent storage units within cubes that will remain after you do reboots. Uh, blue items are, are for work. That's if you're able to do, use these computers for work, use cubes for work. If you can VPN in or isolate some of that stuff off, it will be isolated and stay within those blue containers. But it's just a color. You can change those colors to anything you want that would make more sense to you as a person. The one item on here that I do want to call out is you'll, you'll notice a color here called vault and it's black. That's the most trusted zone. That's where all of your deepest, darkest secrets, where all the bodies are buried. You know, that's where you store that, that information. And it, it is like a vault, but again, Cubes is reinforcing that security at every aspect and layer. So just because, and Vault doesn't have any access to the internet. And that's the other thing that you can control with these. As you move from untrusted to trusted, you're slowly giving up aspects of what you're willing to use from an ease of use, usability layer. So even though work and personal may, have, may be able to use the network, the internet, USB, maybe you realize that you, know, you have a bad habit of picking up USB thumb drives out of the parking lot at work and plugging them into your device. Well, the service cube is blocking and controlling all of that, so only specific cubes would be able to be infected by a, a malicious USB that would be plugged into your system. It's all wrapped and contained. Any questions? So if you had stuff that got infected outside of that cube, how do you go back and cover your deepest darkest secrets so that you can go back into a different cube? Cubes has a built-in backup feature, so you can back up and make even two external trusted USBs and then take it off offline, off-site. So you could recover in that situation. Part of the design is to reduce the chances of the secret space from being the one that got hit. It wants your attack surface area so small to be as small as possible so that the malware did hit you in the red zone, it was contained to the red zone and would have crossed into another zone. You, you probably wouldn't run applications on the vault. You would have right. like a, an abstracted yellow that you're copying data from the vault to then run in that. And that's, and that's where, where I think you might spend some time touching on it next week is direction of flow. Like where is data coming from and where is it going to is a key important area with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did I say a week? Good grief, man. Dadgum it. In the next hour. It's like when the boss when he talks to everybody to the interpreter. We have uh, Win RM joining us uh, remotely. So he made the comment that uh, this cube OS reminds him a little bit of Brony. Hmm. And so I went to Brony in the com, and I was like, what am I doing on the HG website? So looks like Brony isn't a thing anymore. Uh -oh. uh, there are tutorials and documentation still online, but if you just go to their website, um, and if you go to the Wolf, HG Wolf, huh. the Wolf of the HG. What is the, what is the difference like? I see like Debian 11 is in there, is black, but then you have template disks, Unix, WS16 DBM, and then you also have a black template, Unix, WS16. So is there like 
a difference, difference between, between those two Unix? And if so, so what is that difference? There is, is it, this is the template that's displayed anyway. But you also have, these are the core templates that are, it's actually using. And forgive the mouse for jumping around, I'm gonna switch to the keyboard. But you'll notice here you've got the GW and the WS, gateway and the workstation. Whereas then this is just abstracted up and it's just, I think, the collection of it. Okay. So, so another way of looking at how you have the, the cubes defined is to look at the, the cubes manager. manager. So, these so these are all the cubes that are currently defined out of the box in cubes OS. Some of these are listed as templates and this tends to look a little bit confusing. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to sort by template. You'll notice how many IP addresses have been allocated to these. Remember, they're all virtual machines, all virtual guests, basically, to think about it. They're just vApps. And, and so you take a template, and you see how these are defined as templates. Templates aren't actually booted or used at all, but they're referenced by those that use the template. So for example, the Hunix Gateway 16 template is actually called on and used here on the Hunix Gateway 16 sys.hunix. You have a template template, and then, and then you create and boot a pair of virtualized VM off of that. It doesn't have a root file system. It just has just enough to look and feel like an OS and function. Can you create your own custom templates? You can. They can, and this is, that is a great point because so I, I ran uh, Cubes OS on bare metal for a very long time uh, on my home system. And, and you, you couldn't, couldn't, at the time, you couldn't run, run easily a Windows, Windows OS as a VM. Yeah. Like you see here, you've got, you got Fedora, Fedora and Debian. Debian. But, but now, now they, they have it where you can fire up and run Windows as a VM yeah. within, yeah. as a PV8, which is phenomenal, right? <laughs> because, and this is where I got into trouble the first time I took the OSCP was, I was running Zen, and I had Fedora, and I was running a virtualized instance of Windows Server, and it just, crashed hard and, and wouldn't operate, operate when it came to doing the, um, um, the proctored exam. Cube's <coughs> design is also uh, built with an assumed breach model. They, they assume everything is infected. And so that's why like, you can't communicate between most cubes, even though the most trusted layer won't just have arbitrary read access from anything. You have to explicitly grant everything. Um, if you plug in a mouse, it won't just automatically assume unless that's the mouse that was booted up. So the, the rubber duck issue, um, you would have to plug it in and then allocate it in the like the USB manager as well. Um, it's got anti-evil made mm -hmm. uh, built in by default. So um, if there are things installed, it won't do. It will. It will tell you that uh, your your hashes are different. Um, Did you say evil made? Yeah. yeah the, so the, the evil made attack is when you leave your your computer unattended, and the idea being you're at like a a hotel and you leave your laptop to go to dinner. Evil three letter agency comes in, installs a module onto the computer, bolts it back nicely, and now you're completely. Opposed to physical, to complete physical access. Yeah. Um, but if, if they were to connect it into cubes, you would be alerted uh, right away. Okay. Here's an example, example of what the different, different zones, zones look like. like. So back, back in the old day when I was a Unix, Unix and Linux admin, we used to color code the background, background of all of our terminal sessions to know whether we were in like production, don't make any changes, don't crash anything, you know, be generally nicer than you normally are. And then green was dev environments, lab environments, where you could just like burn everything to the ground and nobody really cared, right? And if you look at cubes, it's kind of reinforcing some of that same type of aspects because that red item we saw when it came to the, the virtualized apps is actually reflected around the application when it's running. The entire border and the header are color coded to match the trust zone that you're in. So red box over here on the right is obviously not trusted. Blue is work, working on a presentation. So that's an app that's capable and able to be run in, in the app, that space. And then apparently or orange looking at emergency kittens on Twitter, uh, you know, Twitter and TweetDeck and Facebook are definitely not gonna be in the trust, true trust zone. Right? We're gonna have a layer there. If you're trying to customize based off of the template, is there anything to be aware of? Or is there anything easily that you could um, misconfigure that would 
you know, opening it up a little bit easier. So yeah. that's obviously passing USB devices, stuff like that. Yeah. It is easier because you do have those already banded layers that you can pick, right? So depending upon where your threat model says, I want to be with that specific app, you can pick that specific template and say, all right, I'm going to customize that one. So for example, work. If work lets me use you know, Discord during the day, I'm going to install the Discord app into that template. And so when I boot up anything that's using that template, the app's going to be available to it. So it does kind of help you in that regard. And you can launch your, I guess, specific app. So it's kind of like a container. It would almost like virtualize just the app, and you don't have to launch launch the entire VM. Out of curiosity, you know about the hardware thing that you were talking about, like you can't plug a mouse in without explicitly saying, "Hey, I want this mouse to be used." Can you bake that into a template? So, like, say you have a Bluetooth mouse, you have the capability. You don't, you don't want, want to reconnect Bluetooth every time. Can you bake that into the template? When you install and boot, it'll, it'll take those as, as the, the default okay. Okay. choice. Okay. But if you were to plug it in after boot, yep. it says, wait a minute, you, you had your chance to use the power at all and type in all those passwords again, again, or you need to uh, explicitly allow it. Okay. Cool. And it holds it in a container until you're ready to do something with it. So if you are talking about Situation. Mm -hmm. If somebody gave physical access, or rebooted it, would that duck be trusted then automatically? That's a good question. I mean, I know, like, you probably have to, it's obvious if something's plugged in, but you're on the desktop. Yeah. You may not see all your USB ports. So yeah. Where's the back? So, more, more critical question. How do we do with gaming, gaming like? Elden Ring. Uh, really bad. <laughs> oh, man. Really bad. Oh, okay. This is yeah. Even with wine, this is not going to be your friend. I don't think it's going to run. I no. We could run Doom and anything. We could run Mudlet. I think yeah. I think we could run Mudlet, and I think you could run your mud. Oh, I could totally. Yeah. Anything yeah. yeah. will play Doom. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there, there you go. Well, you could make a container, like a template that is Arch Linux set up like a Steam Deck. Yep. Let's see how that. It's, it's all going to come, gonna down, come down, down to the CPU, CPU and the memory, memory, and obviously the GPU that you have. Oh, yeah, GPU does not play nicely with it's assigning. Not. So I, I had a GPU and the integrated graphics. I could assign the integrated graphics to cubes and it was fine. I could assign the GPU to cubes and it was fine, but I could not you can't pass figure through. out how to pass through. Mm -hmm. There's like magic ways that you can apparently do it, but don't count on that. Yeah, that was so a major hair pulling thing. Early for me with trying to get Windows to run as a, right, because you couldn't pass the graphics adapter through. Cubes is already holding it at DOM zero to give you the console. So I was going to say, say, even if you wanted to go the gaming route, you just put Windows, Windows in there and, and install all your stuff, stuff, but if you, you can't pass through the GPU, then you're kind of like, oh, well. <laughs> you could do a dual boot situation. Just a separate view. Yeah. Or a, or a separate like hard drive, right? Where you're... Horizon APU. You could maybe do that. Because that's, that's integrated. Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, that would capture, so that would be captured for DOM zero, but then if you had a separate GPU, I haven't looked at it in a couple of years, so I'm hesitant to like, like hardcore, like third down the table and say, it's for both, you know? Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Because, and that's one of the benefits of this is, it is security by design baked in at the OS. If you, you want, want Windows, Windows, we've already thrown that model out. <laughs> We're going down a different avenue. <laughs> it is it's possible. I know this that YouTube channel you did was a six game or one PC. A couple of years ago. So you can, can do video password that is working, but I'm gonna focus on the views. Right, exactly. It does, it does take, take like, like everything about, about our computers, like, like this, this thing right here, is all designed around convenience and capturing your data. <laughs> and convenience. Conveniently capturing your data. Mm -hmm. Cubes, 
and it, it takes, takes that, that convenience, convenience out. out. Like, it has some conveniences in it, but the convenience is the focus. Like right. everything else that we use in our lives. The focus is security, being able to, to fail without reducing or compromising others. Um, it has gotten more robust since the last time I looked at it. So I was looking into the backup functionality of it, and it's when you do the backup of DOM zero, only that user directory is really captured out of it. So you can restore your full backup of your Cubes OS from like my home machine if it got burned to the ground and I went and stood up another Cubes install and just laid down my backup. I'm right back up where I left off. So all of those zones for me are restored back where they belong. Seems, Seems like it's advanced. advanced. It's been it, years yeah. since I've seen, seen it. Like, check it out. I really, I really wish, wish it could run better on this. And I thought about bringing it in my desktop, but. <laughs> Too much. Too much. Too much. Yeah. 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 It does have ultra wide monitor support. Unlike, Unlike what, what we're, we're demoing, demoing here, here today <laughs> <laughs> on this Nokia <laughs> handheld. <laughs> but before, before yeah, yeah, last thing. thing. I think, think Cubes OS is great for a fixed, fixed place. Like, like if you're going to do bare metal, metal on something and all the hardware, hardware checks out, you got it spec right. Cubes is going to be great for that. that. If, if you, you want, want a very transient, transient experience and you want to just be mobile and light, and light depending on how much you want to be invisible in this op this operation, if you, if you don't, don't want any possibility that you're going to get picked up by something. Eject, eject the, the hard, hard drive, drive from your, your laptop, laptop so there's, there's no persistent, persistent storage that, that could potentially even be there. You're, you're going to run off of the, the Tails thumb drive, and you're going to eject, if you can, the battery out of the laptop. So you're only running off of a, a hard tap to a power line. So if you pull the power on it, that memory is already starting to, to vaporize. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.